Hello and welcome to Musings on a Galaxy. In this episode I will discuss my thoughts about the first three seasons of The Mandalorian, as well as the book of Boba Fett. I noticed a fair number of people online complaining about the structure of season 3, these people saying they felt that it lacked direction, and that Din was going on silly side quests, like a video game character. The thing is, this is actually how the show has always been, with a lot of seemingly unrelated elements often coming back together at the end of the season. I've noticed this kind of impatience regarding a lot of shows in recent years too, where people seem to want everything at once, rather than waiting to see where the rest of the season will go. I rewatched the first two seasons before watching the third to refresh my memory. While seasons one and two felt much more isolated from the larger galaxy at times, it quickly became apparent that the show was also acting as a bridge between trilogies, filling in aspects of the Emperor cloning plot, and leading to the eventual rise of the First Order. In the Clone Wars and Rebels, Mandalore became an important world, with the Empire becoming particularly interested in the planet during Rebels, so the storyline of the Mandalorian Season 3 felt like the culmination of that unresolved thread. For long-term fans like myself, seeing Bo-Katan reunite her people and retake Mandalore was particularly gratifying. But we'll come back to that shortly. You might not know this, but The Mandalorian wasn't the first live-action Star Wars series ever planned. That honor goes to the Unmade Underworld series. Announced at Celebration 3 back in 2005, Underworld would have been primarily set in the gritty underworld of Coruscant, taking place between Episodes 3 and 4. At least 50 scripts were written, with up to 400 episodes in consideration, with some test footage having been shot. But in 2010, Lucas confirmed it was on hold because it would be prohibitively expensive to produce. He knew the technology would eventually evolve to a point where a live-action show could have a similar scope to the movies, and at a fraction of the cost, but it would take time. With The Mandalorian having been presented to Lucasfilm by John Favreau, it was realized that the technology now existed to create the volume, a soundstage surrounded by LED screens displaying real-time generated backgrounds, finally making a live-action show affordable. Needless to say, George Lucas absolutely loved the volume, it was the culmination of all the technology developed while making his six Star Wars movies, and paved the way to make Star Wars not only cheaper, but better. With Disney looking for a flagship show for their then-upcoming streaming service, The Mandalorian couldn't have come at a better time. My first impression of the show was that it was much more of a space western, with a slower pace very akin to that of Episode 4, A New Hope. This was perfectly welcome, and it worked very well. Being a new series, Season 1 started quite small, but hinted at bigger things. First, we met the unnamed Mandalorian himself. A bounty hunter carrying a weapon taken directly from Boba Fett's animated debut, but given the disintegrator function that Boba was supposedly well known for despite him never actually doing any such thing on screen, it was clear this was made by a big fan of old school Star Wars, using those old ideas to bring new flourishes. This became especially apparent in the use of puppets, that mimic the jankiness of the original trilogy. Of course there's a fair amount of CGI too, but it's used so well that it can be very difficult to tell when a character like Grogu is the puppet, and when he's CGI. Now as I said earlier, during the run of season 3, I noticed a lot of people complaining about the zigzagging story, but I rewatched the first two seasons along with the book of Boba Fett before the new season started. Let's have a brief recap, and I'm sure you'll see what I mean when I say it's always been that way. The first episode introduced a lot without covering much ground story-wise. In very short order we see the Razor Crest, a very rundown pre-Empire ship, which narrowly escapes from a large sea creature, a staple of the movies. The Razor Crest just happens to have a carbon freeze chamber, then there's an Ugnaught who teaches Mando to ride a Blurg, and an IG assassin droid turned bounty hunter which gives their partnership during the climactic shootout a real Boba Fett and IG-88 vibe, and eventually, a teaser introduction to the child, who would later be named Grogu. The very next episode was the first side quest episode. With the Razor Crest dismantled by ever-greedy Jawas, Mando had to fight a Mudhorn to get its egg for the Jawas, so they would give him the parts of his ship back. Of course, this was really an excuse to have the child save Mando, demonstrating his force powers and cementing a bond that will run throughout the series, and similarly, each episode has a similar reason for its being at its core. After a battle against Imperial forces to rescue the child in Episode 3, we got a very different Episode 4, with Mando landing on a seemingly peaceful world that's having trouble with Clatoonian raiders. Of course, Mando also learns that other bounty hunters are still seeking Grogu after he escaped the guild in the previous episode, and so he must keep moving to keep him safe. Episode 5 starts to expand the scope of the show even further, taking Mando to Tatooine, introducing Peli Motto and Fennec Shand, and teasing the return of Boba Fett. Then we get the prison transport breakout episode, essentially another side quest, 
but a very memorable one, followed by the two-part finale that introduces Moff Gideon and more of the Imperial Remnant, ending with the revelation that Gideon has the Darksaber, an important relic from the Clone Wars and Rebels animated shows. Oh, Hermando finally got his jetpack. For one season of just eight episodes, there's quite a lot packed in there. I enjoyed the season enough to rewatch it a couple of times, which I hadn't done with the Disney-era Star Wars movies, so I was definitely feeling this show. The potential was huge. Season 2 did a great job of realizing much of that potential. Right off the bat we get one of the most cinematic episodes of the entire series so far, with Mando returning to Tatooine again, meeting Marshal Cobb Vanth, who procured Boba Fett's armor from the Jawas, who agrees to give it to Mando in exchange for killing the first ever on-screen live crate dragon. It's a spectacular showcase of visual effects, and of course, Boba makes his return known at the end of the episode, wearing Tuscan robes as he watches Mando leave with his armor. The whole area of Mos Pelgo and Cobb Vanth himself are taken from the Aftermath novels, which are widely regarded to be pretty terrible, with Chuck Wendig's writing being fairly criticized for its very staccato style. He also wrote the terrible graphic novel adaptation of The Force Awakens, which really has to be seen to appreciate just how bad and lazy it is. Look up a free preview online, it really is astonishing that he got paid for that. Anyway, this all shows how, with the proper care, even elements from bad Star Wars novels can be molded into something worthwhile, and the Mandalorian executed those elements perfectly. They even somehow made Timothy Oliphant likable, which I honestly didn't think possible, but it's been quite a few years since he stunk up the screen in Die Hard 4, so maybe he finally learned a thing or two. Anyway, I digress. Episode 2 then took us on another side quest as Mando has to deliver a frog lady and her eggs to another world without entering hyperspace, and they encounter ice spiders taken straight from Ralph McQuarrie's concept art. Episode 3 gave us the biggest link to the animated shows yet, with Katie Sackhoff reprising the role of Bo-Katan Chris, the first voice actor to bring their animated character to live action. It's a good job the character looked reasonably similar to her, even if Katie is a bit younger than Bo should really be at this time. We learn that Bo is distrustful of the Mandalorian clan Din belongs to, thinking of them as religious zealots, but she agrees to help point Din in the direction of a Jedi who can help Grogu, once he completes another side quest for her, of course. This time it involves trying to steal weapons from an Imperial ship, then she decides to capture the ship itself. I find this exploration of the Imperial Remnant and its activities to be especially interesting, as I always felt episodes 7-9 to nine in the movies should have dealt with the New Republic fighting the Imperial Remnant. In fact, Lucas himself said this is what it would have been, though that version of the trilogy would have taken place 5-10 to ten years after Return of the Jedi. Lucas also spoke of Maul being the lead villain of the trilogy, in the role of a galactic crime boss, with Darth Talon from the Legacy Comics as his apprentice. It also would have been really interesting to see the Empire as the scrappy rebels and the New Republic as the dominant force, which is what Dave Filoni and Jon Favreau recently confirmed was their intent in The Mandalorian. Episode 4 of Season 2 further expands upon the mysterious plans of the Imperial Remnant, which all ties into explaining the return of Darth Sidious in The Rise of Skywalker. Despite the sequel trilogy making moves to avoid references to prequel trilogy concepts like midi-chlorians, likely because a lot of supposed fans misconstrued it as a biological explanation for the Force itself which it isn't. It actually deepened the mythology in a brilliant way, the Mandalorian embraces such things in the plot to clone the Emperor. They used the term M-count, but we know what they meant. Episode 5 brought Ahsoka to live action, featuring a perfectly cast Rosario Dawson, and teasing the return of Thrawn who disappeared along with Ezra Bridger at the end of the Rebels series. Ahsoka is the one who gets to reveal Grogu's real name, and we got to see a flashback to Order 66, which Grogu witnessed from within the Jedi Temple on Coruscant, but we wouldn't learn how he escaped until Season 3. This episode expanded the scope of the show enormously, really cementing its place as an essential piece in the overall canon, and Dave Filoni himself wrote and directed it, which makes sense given that he created Ahsoka. Episode 6 further expanded upon that by taking Grogu to the planet Tython, a fairly recent addition to the lore, for him to contact another Jedi via the Force. This was when Boba Fett and Fennec Shand returned, with Boba finally getting his armor back. With Din's ship destroyed by the Empire, and Grogu kidnapped by a group of very Iron Man-like dark troopers, the trio fled Tython in the Slave One. Disney might be trying to sweep that ship's name under the rug, but I will continue to call it by its proper name. Another side quest episode sees the return of Miggs Mayfeld, a fan favorite from season 1, to assist Mando in tracking the location of Gideon's ship. The episode makes reference to Operation Cinder, a plot that originated in the new canon comic arc Shattered Empire, also heavily featured in the story campaign of the newer Battlefront 2, and referenced in other books and comics since. It's a part of the new canon that makes absolutely no sense to me, 
as not only is this contingency plan delivered by a droid sentinel displaying the Emperor's face on its screen in a universe where full holograms exist, but the very fact that the Emperor even had a contingency plan goes against the character's inherent flaw, his overconfidence. The Emperor never even conceived of the possibility that the second Death Star would be destroyed. All the way back in The Phantom Menace we saw that Darth Sidious's visions weren't infallible, he failed to predict that Padme and the Gungans would join forces, so Luke's assessment of the Emperor was spot on. This was enforced by the Emperor's curt response, revealing that Luke had got under his skin. Anyway, Operation Cinder involved the Empire using orbital bombardments to punish Imperial worlds for failing to prevent his death. Yes, you heard that right. It's absolutely stupid, and I wish the Mandalorian had ignored it, but here we are. This is the same nonsense that led to the Empire trying to kill all survivors of Alderaan because why bother destroying a planet to spread fear if you're going to kill the people whose stories would continue to spread that fear? I doubt Lucas would have signed off on either of those. Heck, he might have okayed them for the expanded universe then ignored the events on screen, since the EU was never canon in the first place. The finale of season 2 brought back the Jedi, using not very convincing deepfake technology to change another actor's face to look like a younger Mark Hamill. Hamill himself was on set, acting out the scenes to demonstrate how he would play it, which the younger actor then mimicked. I wasn't completely convinced by his motions, the way he clenched his fist when force crushing the dark troopers looked overdone, but it wasn't a bad first try. Gideon was defeated and captured after tricking Din into fighting him, winning the dark saber, undermining Bo-Katan's plans to retake Mandalore, but it would be a couple of years before we got to see where that went next, as before that we got the book of Boba Fett. I also want to take a moment to mention that the whole concept of Beskar stopping a lightsaber blade didn't exist before the Mandalorian, and is absolutely ridiculous. Assuming Jango's reserve jetpack was made of Beskar in Attack of the Clones, Mace Windu's lightsaber went right through the top of it when the Jedi killed the bounty hunter. In fact, those jetpacks are incredibly vulnerable, aren't they? The only thing we've seen stop a lightsaber in canon are the electrostaffs wielded by the Magna Guards in Revenge of the Sith, and that was only because the energy visible at each tip runs throughout the actual staff itself. They're not lightsaber-proof, just resistant. Initially, I thought Din parting ways with Grogu at the end of Season 2 would be a good thing for the show, as the quest to reunite him with his own kind took up a huge part of those two seasons, and it was starting to get stale. But that ending was to be reversed in double-quick time, completely undermining the emotion of it on repeat viewings. Of course, it's impossible to talk about The Mandalorian without also discussing the book of Boba Fett, which acted like Season 2.5 of the flagship show, which was teased before its release. Because of this, you can't go from season 2 to 3 of The Mandalorian, or you miss an essential part of the story. I don't know if perhaps this is why so many people seem to dislike the book of Boba Fett. Well, I say so many. It's usually a vocal minority, and you should never kowtow to the minority, but given Boba's absence in season 3 of Mando, I fear that may have happened. Episode 1 wasted no time revealing how Boba survived the Sarlacc. I've seen people online moan about how ridiculous that is, but I think they forgot the part where the creature supposedly digests its victims slowly over a thousand years. That's a pretty important detail. Plus, Beskar is apparently virtually indestructible now. The show moved pretty fast, using flashbacks to show how Boba bonded with the tribe of Tuscans who captured him, learning their ways, and how to fight like them. Interestingly enough, Temuera Morrison wanted to bring some of his Maori culture to the role, and this fit perfectly with the Tuscans and their gaffy sticks and fighting style. By the end of the first episode, present-day Boba has made his presence known in Mos Espa, being attacked by mysterious assailants, while in the flashbacks he ingratiates himself with the Tuscans by killing a vicious sand monster. The second episode introduced Chris Santan from the comics, and boy did he look perfect in live action. It also featured very convincing CGI huts, and the flashback gave us the superb train-stopping sequence, also bringing back the pikes from the Clone Wars, and showing us their unmasked faces for the first time. Episode 3 introduced the bike gang that some people weren't keen on, but I didn't mind them. They were very reminiscent of American Gear Fitty. It's also the episode that saw Boba gifted his very own Ranker, who of course is trained by Danny Trejo. Episode 4 wrapped up the flashbacks, though still left a few unanswered questions like how Boba learned about his armor being in Mos Pelgo, which is odd because he spent time looking for his armor in the Sarlacc first, but I guess it isn't too much to just gather he got wind of it from somewhere. Episode 5 was of course where things got a little strange. I was expecting to see Mando after the music QTs in the previous episode, but I wasn't expecting him to completely hijack an episode of Boba's show. The title character doesn't appear at all, which is very odd. The episode served to bring us up to speed on what Din had been up to, showing that he felt lost without Grogu, 
but it doesn't convey how much time had passed. Din wielded the dark saber but injured himself, suggesting it hadn't been long, but it feels like very little time passes between this, Din trying to visit Grogu, and Grogu rejoining Din after rejecting Luke. I find it less likely that Grogu was training with Luke for about two years as Filoni and Favreau suggested, and more likely that most of that time passed after Din and Grogu were reunited. The actual two-year jump off screen happened between seasons two and three of Mando, with the reunion only about a year later in reality, so the timescale felt off to me. Episode 6 gave us live-action Cad Bane, Boba's one-time mentor turned bitter rival from the Clone Wars series. It's a pity one particular Clone Wars arc remains unfinished, as it culminated in a showdown between Cad Bane and Boba Fett, with the two shooting one another, resulting in the dent in Boba's helmet, rather making a mockery of how indestructible Beskar armor has suddenly become in these shows, and Cad Bane ended up with a steel plate in his skull, visible when his hat gets knocked off in the next episode, and also in his appearance on The Bad Batch. Episode 6 also gave us a vastly improved deep-faked Luke, using an actor who's not just a better fit physically, but who also managed to portray Luke's movements much more convincingly. Unfortunately, because this all has to match up to the ill-conceived sequel trilogy, Luke has to act like the Jedi have learned nothing since their downfall and forces Grogu to choose between being a Jedi or a Mandalorian, like he never heard of Tar Vizsla. On a side note here, an important plot point from The Phantom Menace was the death of Qui-Gon Jinn, who would have been the master Anakin needed to prevent his fall to the dark side. Qui-Gon was a more unconventional Jedi who frequently disobeyed the Council, and after the ultimate failure of the Jedi, you'd think Obi-Wan and Yoda would rethink the approach to forbidding attachments, and Luke's Jedi Order was the perfect opportunity to do just that. But sadly, there's only one on-screen continuity, so this is the corner Luke's been written into. Episode 7 is the grand finale, bringing everything together for one massive showdown, featuring massive droids clearly based on the droidicas, and Grogu return to Mando's side after just two episodes apart. I say two, because I'm not counting the first four Boba episodes there, just what we've seen of Mando since they parted ways. If you had forgotten a lot of what happened in those previous episodes, perhaps you didn't have time to re-watch them before the new season, I hope now you can remember that it's always had a somewhat disjointed style. There's nothing wrong with that, just go along with it and enjoy the ride. So now we come to season 3, where the time Mando and Grogu were apart becomes more apparent, as Nevaro is massively transformed. This season had to be somewhat different to the first two by necessity, because Mando is no longer on a quest to reunite Grogu with his people. Initially I thought we might see Mando without the child for at least some of this season, but obviously that all changed real fast. It's clear the intention of the Mandalorian is that Din must always be with Grogu. Episode 1 mostly just brought us up to speed, laying out Mando's plan to visit Mandalore, which I fully expected to see this season. Some new villainous pirates cause some mild bother, but otherwise not much happens, besides teasing the return of IG-11, and a brief visit with Bo-Katan. Episode 2 is much more like it, taking us deep into the minds of Mandalore, with Mando being captured by a strange creature, requiring Grogu to quickly get back to the ship and get Bo's help. She gets to wield the Darksaber again, and is clearly far more adept with it than Mando. I actually expected him to offer it to her there and then, so I wasn't surprised when he later used this to explain why she deserved the blade. It was an interesting, exciting episode. The end of the episode was fantastic, giving us our first ever canon glimpse of an actual mythosaur. Previously, it wasn't even certain that they actually existed in the Star Wars universe, but of course they'd been mentioned a fair bit in the old expanded universe. Episode 3 was a very different affair. After an exciting opening featuring a dogfight worthy of the movies, we spent the rest of the episode on Kor Rusant. Now, I didn't mind this, it was necessary to take a moment at some point in this era to explain the state of the galaxy politically, because the sequel trilogy somehow completely failed in that regard. We know the New Republic is in power but is struggling, and here we get to see the extent of that. We also see how easy it is for Imperials to pretend they're reformed when they're not, because the New Republic doesn't have the resources to monitor them more closely. Thankfully, it wasn't a slog like the Undor show, despite being one of the longest episodes. Episode 4 was a surprisingly brief episode that mostly served to bond the group, with Din saving of Paz's foundling to become an important moment in a later episode. In an interesting flashback, we finally got to see how Grogu escaped Order 66, with Ahmed Best returning to the Star Wars franchise as Keller and Beck. Best first played the character in Jedi Temple Challenge YouTube series. Given how much abuse he suffered for playing Jar Jar Binks, which was completely unfair, undeserved, and uncalled for, it's great to see him finally return. He was fantastic, and he was already a friend of Latif Crowder, who performs Mando's stunts, 
so they had fun working together on the fight choreography as Kettleran took out several clone troopers during the rescue. Episode 5 brought back pirate Captain Gory and Shard to give Din an excuse to bring the cover to Nevaro, and once again, it was a really fun action-filled spectacle. I don't really like action just for the sake of it but it's used really well in this show. This was also the episode that gave us a brief cameo in the form of Zeb from Rebels. ILM did a fantastic job of creating a realistic-looking CGI render of the character, and of course it was great to hear Steve Bloom's voice again. Given how much the upcoming Ahsoka series is turning into a Rebels reunion, it seems likely we can look forwards to seeing more of him. Episode 6 was the Weird Cheese Dream 1 with Jack Black, Lizzo, and Doc Brown. It was very divisive, but I really enjoyed it. The droid bar was great, it was nice seeing battle droids and their super variants again, and yes, it was another side quest episode, but it also culminated in a great fight between Axe and Bo. I don't mind these little side episodes that help bring texture to the galaxy. It's a good reminder that there is a whole galaxy out there still, and the callbacks to the Clone Wars, particularly the mention of Dooku and the Separatists, were well used. Episode 7 is where the series starts to ramp up as usual, with the return of Moff Gideon, who met with the Shadow Council as they plotted in secret to rebuild the Empire. This is where they're acting like rebels and it's really interesting. I'd like an idea of what resources are at their disposal, but I'd also like to know where the Praetorian Guards came from. When exactly between the Emperor's death and this point, about seven years later, still 23 years before movie episodes 7 through 9, did someone decide to replace the Royal Guard? Was it the Emperor himself? For all the talk of cloning experiments, the Emperor must have had a clone body ready at the time of his death to immediately travel to, as the law suggests he would otherwise be lost. I mean, if that isn't the case, how do we know for sure he's supposed to be dead in episode 9? Oh what a tangled web they wove. Anyway, this episode gave us the fantastic moments with Grogu piloting IG-12, which I found really funny, but also the new Beskar wearing dark troopers that look like the prototype Boba Fett design. They're still rather easily killed, I don't know why the Empire decided to go back to human troops after previously deciding droids were superior, but maybe they're clones, and supposedly better than the droids? It's left annoyingly unanswered. Paz's death is a little odd as it felt unnecessary in the context, he could have just gone back to create a choke point using his heavy repeater then fled when the last dark trooper dropped. At least these Praetorian guards actually did something, rather than the weird movie versions with vanishing weapons who ran away for no reason. Episode 8 was part 2 of this story, bringing the action to a climax as Bo and Din faced off against Moff Gideon in his mechanized Beskar suit. Or is it just a clone of Gideon, with the real villain hiding somewhere, twirling his moustache? I guess we'll have to wait and see. Some fans expected a big reveal in this episode given the pluralized nature of the previous episode's title, The Spies. But nothing unexpected happened, at least not that we know of. Season 4 has apparently already been written, so we will see. Hopefully there won't be as long a wait for that. But the ending made a lot of people happy, Din adopted Grogu, and they got a peaceful little home all to themselves. It could make a happy ending, but it feels like the first three seasons have a bit of a trilogy structure going on. The first season introduced the core characters and the initial threat, which was defeated but not completely. The second season expanded upon that threat, while adding depth to the characters and their journey, with the temporary loss of Grogu acting as the down ending. Then the third part was the rallying of the forces and the big confrontation with the enemy, seemingly leading to that enemy's ultimate defeat. Seemingly. I think the show is as good as it's ever been, and that some people just have really short memories. I expect they remembered the first two seasons as being better than they actually are, making the third seem not as good by comparison, but it's still enjoyable in the way that it's always been. As I said previously, I doubt Star Wars will ever be as good as it was during the Lucas era, but this is a lot better than the five movies Disney forced Lucasfilm to rush out after buying the company. Hopefully in time, we'll get even more shows, and maybe even some movies, that are as good as this. I eagerly anticipate both the upcoming Ahsoka series in August, and season 4 when it arrives. Also, if you haven't watched the Disney Gallery making of The Mandalorian and The Book of Boba Fett, definitely give them a go. There's a heap of interesting behind-the-scenes stuff about how the shows are made and the thought processes involved. It's also really interesting to hear Dave Filoni share insights he gained from working alongside George Lucas during his time on the Clone Wars series. What do you think of The Mandalorian so far? Feel free to share your comments, either here or on my Facebook page, Musings on a Galaxy Star Wars Discussions Core. Thanks for listening. <music>